Hi, I'm Tad Rosinski, speaker, educator, and expert in corporate responsibility and product stewardship. The video you're about to watch is from a class that I taught in 2010. As you'll see, many of the topics are very relevant today and really demonstrate why corporate responsibility is so important. This is a first of a series of different videos that I'll be putting together as well as white papers that basically build upon the topics that are in this video and demonstrate why corporate responsibility is so critical for everything that we do in America and the world. Now one thing that's really interesting is you know we are living on existing capital. Well we're going to talk about natural capital here in a minute but all these ecosystem services that I just talked about that are giving us life, giving our families life and our friends and communities we live in <clears throat> are only a finite amount. Okay, so we know it's a closed system. There's only so much water. There's only so many resources. So we are really living on the existing capital that we have, and we're starting to borrow from the future is what I, the way I look at it. We know we're probably over-borrowing in many areas. Okay, just the things we do to the planet have big, big impact. All right, let's talk about this issue. Population, what do we know about it? A lot of people, right? You know, think about it. I mean, I've lived, let's see, I moved to Philadelphia in 1983 when I got hired by a Philadelphia Electric Company. And I lived in the city, you know, so I was in a pretty populated area. But then I moved out to the suburbs. And uh, when I lived in the suburbs, the area around me was uh, farmland. You know, there, I lived in an old farmhouse right in Collegeville. And... Uh, there was nothing but farms and open space. Now the Limerick Collegeville area went from a populate well, Limerick went from 2,000 people, say in 1985, to now we have 28,000 people. Okay, so I've seen firsthand just where I live what what happens when we have population growth, uh, huge impacts as far as uh, traffic, noise, pollution, things like that. So if we go on to um, zeropopulationgrowth.com and they have a little clock there ticking of how many people there are on the planet as of probably a week ago when I put this slide together we're up to about 6.8 billion people on the planet and it's growing exponentially there's over 309 million people in the United States uh, 119 million people added to the planet last year and that population growth rate is only 1.15 percent however we have to think about, and if you look at the image on up in here, you know that might be a picture maybe in China or Indonesia or Shanghai or somewhere. Uh, there's a heck of a lot of people, right? And there's a heck of a lot of people that don't have the resources or have the material goods that we all have, and uh, we really have to think about that because I can tell you from living in the United States, my vision of how other people live is only is skewed. You know, because I'm used to the way I've lived. I've been here in this area for my whole life. And I've been to several other countries, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, places like that, and I've seen how other people live. Never been to China yet, although we have a project coming up there shortly. And it's really interesting <clears throat> when we think about the fact that we have this very massively growing population of people that have to live on a planet with finite resources and we also have this great amount of people that are going to need to be employed. Okay? And if we know anything about our current system, uh, when you hear about layoffs in the news, what typically happens to the stock price of the company? Does it go up or down? It goes up. So we're re rewarding uh, labor reductions and labor productivity improvements. But you know, if we've got this continually growing population, where's everybody going to work? Okay, things we have to think about. We also know that there's a small percentage of this 6.8 billion people that live like us in the United States and other developed countries. So if we look at, this is a, an old uh, study that was done by the United Nations trying to identify how population or predict where population might be. So if we look at where we might be in 2050, you know, we're getting up around 9 or 10 billion people, which is three another 300 billion or another 3 billion on top of what we already have. So the question is, do we have the resources and do we have 
the ability to support all those people when we don't even have the knowledge or the technology to even redesign the life support systems that we're impacting. We've all really benefited from industrialization. The first industrial revolution has been great for me. It's been great for all of you. I have a car. I have a couple cars, actually, uh, company vehicles. I've got computers. I've got a nice home. Uh, I've got anything I want, cell phone, computer. You know, so this first industrial revolution has been excellent, provided me all the material goods I ever wanted. We also know that we've done some really good things in this first industrial revolution to come up with much better health care. Okay? Think about what's the average uh, life expectancy of a man now? 76, 77. Okay? What was it back in the 1800s? 45, you know? So we've gotten really smart. We've figured out how to make people live longer. We've gotten great technology now. You know, you can go get an MRI and see if you've got something in your brain that'll kill you, not, you know, before you even get hit with it. All kinds of great things happening. <clears throat> but there's a cost to that. So, uh, like I said, we are enjoying the, the benefits of this. And, you know, we're in this group right here, 1.2 billion enjoying the benefits. But what, what about the ones, the folks in China and India that want to start to live like us? And then the other folks that are in countries still where they're living in huts and they're just living off the land. You know, they're eventually going to want to become like us. So if we look at the distribution of resources, all the, all the um, areas you see in dark blue here are what are considered uh, the developed countries, like the United States and Europe and everything. First of all, we only make up about 1.2 billion people out of the entire population of 6.8. 15% of the population, we control 85% of the wealth. We use about 88% of the natural resources, and that number varies now because China is catching up really fast. And the unbelievable thing is we are only this small amount of the population. We're creating 75% of the pollution and waste on the entire planet. And we have a com country like China that is just unbelievable in the way they're growing. And they're basically building a new fossil power uh, electricity plant a week over there. And they're burning coal. And they're not using any scrubbers or any other technology to minimize impacts like we've learned that we need to do. And the interesting thing is I, the average U.S. citizen, I consume about 35 times more resources than someone who lives in India. So with that, if we look at the numbers for the developing countries, that's about 5.5, 5.6 billion people, 85% of the population, only 15% of the wealth. But look at this. They're only using 12% of the resources and 25% of the pollution and waste. So if we are running out of oil, running out of fossil fuels, at least the recoverable materials at such a rapid rate, with only 1.2 billion of us living really well, how are we going to supply all those resources and all of everything to all these other 5 billion people that are going to want that? How are we going to do it? It's not like we can go to another planet because we only have one planet. Remember, it's a closed system. And you have to remember, too, with a closed system, there is no away. I don't know if you... You know, you think you take your trash out and you put it down the end of the street at, uh, once a week. That doesn't go away. That trash is just stored in a landfill for as long as it takes. The nuclear waste spent fuel that's up at Limerick is not going to go away. Very scary stuff. So, you know, we can be doing all the things we're doing, but there is no way here, folks. So everything we're pumping out into the world <clears throat> is going to come back to us in some form. So look at all these blue countries here that are the developing countries. Your challenge in this class, and when you do your assignment on the last night, is how you're going to figure out how you're going to balance this so these folks can have a good quality of life and live in a manner that they want to live like us. Have you ever heard the term caring capacity? We define that as the maximum number of organisms a local, regional, or global area can support to absorb our pollution and waste, to replenish resources, and sustain human and other species over many generations. So, carrying capacity. If we go back to the picture of the Earth, do we even know, okay, we're at 6.8 billion people and growing rapidly. How many people can we really support? Can we support 10 billion? And then we have to step back and ask ourselves, at what quality of life? Okay, if they all want to live like us, and they all want to be eating steak and lobster and driving cars, you know, five cars per family or whatever it is, 
plus all the computers, I don't think it's going to work. Could we support 10 billion people that are just eking out survival? Yeah, we could do that, right? Because what are, we'll get to a slide in a minute, but what are our basic necessities in life? Let me see if I have that slide handy. These are our basic necessities, right? Food, water, shelter, air. If we wanted to survive on this planet, any one of us, we could survive with these four things, okay? I don't need a cell phone. I don't need oil. I don't need a car. All I need is food, clean air, clean water, and shelter, and I can survive. Cavemen did it. Every species that lives in the natural world does it. You know, the rabbits, the squirrels, they all do it just living on the bare minimum. They don't need all the material goods. So anyway, carrying capacity, really important. Let's, let's talk about a, a study that was done uh, kind of by accident. Uh, if you ever heard of St. Matthew's Island, it's a really great case study on carrying capacity. And we're going we're gonna to discuss that a bit here. Uh, 1944, there was 29 reindeer introduced on this island, St. Matthew's Island, uh, by the United States Coast Guard or military. And what they were put there was to provide food for uh, men that were going to be stationed there, okay, uh, in the military set setting. And 1944, they uh, released these 29 reindeer. 26 of them were female, three were male, okay, because we wanted to get some diversity in the population. And... Uh, they estimated the carrying capacity of that island to be 1,600 to 2,300 reindeer. So 1944 to 1957, roughly uh, 13 years, the population went up to 1,320, okay? They knew that the island was perfect. It had no predators, okay? No wolves, nothing to eat the reindeer. It had good food, plenty of clean water, uh, shelter. The climate was just right. The reindeer really thrived there, and they enjoyed it thoroughly. <clears throat> But then in 1963, uh, six years, uh, the population ballooned up to 6,000 animals. So the carrying capacity was exceeded greatly. In 1966, there was massive starvation, uh, like you said, with the subsistence living like these reindeer were kind of doing. They basically decimated the island. They ate everything that grew. Um, you know, they, there was all this disease, and suddenly major crash in population. However, there were some issues. You know, back in the day, we all figured that if you exceed carrying capacity in any way, that a population would probably stabilize and you would never have severe crash. But this kind of gave us a living life example of what really happens if you exceed ca carrying capacity. 42 reindeer were left. Uh, I think there was only one male, and they were, or they were all females. And by 1980, they all died out. So the point I'm trying to make here is we are messing around on a much bigger land area, obviously, you know, 8,000-mile diameter planet, with something we don't have a clue on what we're, you know, first of all, how many people can we put, how much can we keep degrading the environment, and that kind of thing. And I love working on uh, very closed systems that are finite. Like a, an island you can really uh, do some great things on. I had a couple students when I was teaching this, the sustainable community design and development class that were from uh, various islands, and it was really cool because, you know, they couldn't just go mine something. They had to bring everything on, get their waste off, you know, all kinds of neat things. We actually just did a really nice project up in Nantucket as well, and we had all these issues with getting our materials on the island to build this building, and then what do we do with all the waste? You know, so designing this building to be as green as possible was really important so we didn't have to create it waste and all kinds of interesting challenges there. So the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, we have this living, breathing experiment on St. Matthew's Island, and, you know, we kind of have to look at that because, let's see what's going on here. There we go. Because we really don't know what the carrying capacity of the Earth is. And we don't know what level we can continue to abuse it. So you go from this, you know, very healthy down to mass death and starvation, not a very good, attractive situation for me. Especially, you know, I kind of like being here, like seeing my wife and kids and all that kind of thing. So, again, these images are real, and this was an experiment that, you know, we really don't hear much about. Just like all the issues that are happening on the planet right now, we don't hear much about it. Climate change is a big deal, we're hearing about that, but what about acid rain? You don't hear anything about that, and we're going to see in a little bit that it's a really major real problem still that it's not on anybody's radar. 
We can also define our present system of a take-make-waste society. Okay, right? We essentially take resources from the earth, we make stuff, and then we throw it away. But remember, I told you there is no way, so we dispose of it, because we are a disposable society. And if you think about it, we have uh, a system that's really built on consumption. Why are, why are we in this recession right now? I mean, there's multiple factors, but what's one of the biggest causes of the recession? What's the biggest measure of economic growth? Consumer spending, and nobody's spending money. They're starting to spend money. But, you know, we are in this situation because of, number one, nobody's spending money. Number two, the banks made some really bad deals so they could line their own pockets, which caused that major crash in subprime mortgage situation, which has forced banks out of business, you know, people are losing their homes, very bad practices, you know, uh, giving people credit that they didn't deserve for, you know, taking loans to build these homes. But we are really built on consumption. And the challenge I have is, and I've been thinking about this for, let's see, 1998 is the first time I met Ray Anderson. I got so into sustainability then, I read every book I could, and then I, you know, started my company in 2001. I've been really thinking about how do we redo this system that we have where everything's based on consumption. We have to keep making things and people have to keep buying them. And for a company to grow, you've got to sell more stuff. How do we design the system that we don't do it that way? So we're going to be talking about that a lot in this class, but you know, it's not an easy answer, is it? And again, if you remember, I definitely mentioned the fact that we live in the United States and we have a very skewed sense of reality, I think, I can tell you for a fact, my kids will never know life without a microwave, never know life without a computer, never know life without central air conditioning. You know, I'm not that old of a person. I grew up with no microwave, no cell phone, no computers, no air conditioning, and we lived just fine. Okay, so we're creating, but think about it, we're creating a whole society now. Every generation is going to be used to having something that previous generations were able to live fine without. As all of us, you know, the point of this class is to get you to start opening your eyes and thinking differently. So when we think about consumerism, these are some nice images of, of consumerism. You know, we've got the Escalade. Uh, we've got the mall with everybody there buying stuff to keep, that, keep our economy going, right, because it's a consumer-driven economy. So if people aren't spending money, then stock prices are going down. People are losing their jobs, all kinds of nasty things. We all have cell phones, so imagine... Just think about it. Multiply this cell phone by billions. Where do they go when they're done? Here's a pile, um, probably in China somewhere. They're eventually going to, you know, do something with these. How about cars? Good thing about cars is that we can recycle some of that. Okay. Computer monitors. Huge issue for us. Do you know what's in a computer monitor? And take some guesses. Yes. All electronic components, don't they have like cadmium and lead and um, copper and like all kinds of heavy metals? Oh, they do. <laughs> but those metals are nicely stored in the earth where they can stay safe. But we, are, we got really smart and we're good at extracting those resources and figuring out how to make really cool things. Like that cell phone, man, this Blackberry, I can be anywhere. I can, I can get on the internet. I can get my email. Totally connected. I can never get away, ever unless I turn it off and leave it. Just went on a great fishing trip last Friday, and I purposely left this in the car off because I knew it would be buzzing and buzzing and buzzing. So <clears throat> there are very nasty chemicals, and everything that you see in this picture, here's oil filters, uh, the Escalade. Imagine how many parts go into one Escalade and all the energy and labor that goes into making that vehicle. Imagine all these people at this mall all spending money, right, keeping that economy pumped up. So, again, huge issues here. And the, the, the hard thing is we're so accustomed to living in our own little world. You know what you have in your own house. You know what your friends have. But let's multiply that then by the billions of people. And it's just tremendous amount of materials. I can tell you this is an old graph that I like to use that if we evaluate this, this is a graph as in millions of metric tons. Uh, raw material consumption in the United States, it's about 100,000 to 187,000 pounds of natural resources per year, 
per person to live the way we do. And if we look at this graph, the blue is construction materials and industrial materials, and look at the size of these. Huge amount of materials. And again, this is kind of dated. It's only up till 1995. I haven't been able to find a more recent study. But imagine this building that we're in right now, this is all construction materials. And it's only one building. And there's millions of buildings out there. And you can see what happens. Isn't this interesting? Look at this graph. We've had major dips in consumption uh, in big, big problems. Depression, World War I, World War II. Here was another recession in the late 80s, the oil crisis. Every one of those has created some drop in consumption, and that's what we're seeing right now. So if we can correlate that drop in consumption to economic issues, there's a direct match, and that's where we are right now. Nobody's building homes. Nobody's buying anything. So we have this economic crisis that we're in that has raised our unemployment rate in the United States to 10%. Imagine that. We, have, we lose a few million jobs here, but imagine in China how many jobs were lost because we're not buying all that stuff that people like to buy at Walmart and everywhere else that we get. Okay? So really critical here to look at the fact that we use a lot of materials. Okay, let's talk economics a little bit. How do we measure success or measure progress in the world and in our country? It's through gross domestic product, right? So we're measuring our overall economic output. It's all the money that's exchanged for any good or service that's made within the borders of a country. So we know right now our GDP is kind of on the downturn, still not recovering very well from this recession because people aren't buying stuff and spending money. And it's a good, you know, it's the best system we have right now for measuring how we're doing from, from an economic standpoint. And it, you know, measures private consumption, gross investment, government spending, exports minus imports. All these factors go in, and we get these reports every month. And sometimes when the GDP numbers are good, the stock market prices go up, right? Because people are like, oh, yeah, the economy's recovering. Let's buy more stuff. But the one problem we have with GDP is... I don't know if it's a really good measure of economic progress because it measures the exchange of all money for everything. So think about it. I mentioned that the asthma treatment that my daughter is getting, when I buy that medication or buy a nebulizer for her or take her to the doctor, I'm exchanging money, which increases my G the GDP. Same thing with that Gulf oil spill. There's going to be billions of dollars. In fact, I'm in a building right now that we where our office is that there's an environmental company that's uh, connected to the spill, and they've, they get calls weekly. We need 200 more people to get down here to help us. So suddenly they're creating all these jobs, which is measured in, as a positive in GDP. Same thing with social issues. You know, we've got situations where we've got people addicted to drugs. We have to do treatment to get them unaddicted or try to help them. We've got people in prisons. You know, the prison population keeps growing rapidly. But all that's creating jobs and exchanging money. Every new prison we've got to build is more money going into the economy that's increasing the, the gross domestic product. <clears throat> so we have a system that is not a really good measure because, you know, ideally I'd rather be measuring the number of solar systems that got installed and the number of power plants that were able to be retired as a good measure of progress. Or the decreases in cancer and other at illnesses that are occurring in the you know, to people, or the fact that we have less people going to prison, or the fact that our government maybe can get a little smaller because we've designed our system so well in this next industrial revolution we're going to learn about that we don't have to regulate the chemicals that are used because we, these companies aren't emitting any toxics anymore. The other thing that this doesn't really include is good things like volunteerism. Do any of you do any volunteer work or you know, you work with the kids or you're involved with your kid's school or church. You know, all these things that give us family values and community, we have no measure of that because there's no money exchanged. I probably volunteer 40, 80, 60 hours a, a year, you know, for different activities. And uh, none of that gets counted, but I've made some impact somewhere. I've helped somebody. We've done some positive good. I, we do a stream cleanup every year with the Perkiom Watershed Conservancy. We sponsor some bike, uh, bike races that raise money for women's heart disease and things like that. And that's not being captured anywhere because I didn't get paid for that. I didn't pay taxes on my time. Same thing with you know, trying to maintain a good family. 
uh, have a strong family. It takes a lot of work to keep a family together. You know, there's divorce rates are so high and everything like that, and there's no value placed on that. Women that stay home to take care of their kids don't aren't contributing to GDP because they're not earning money, but they're doing a valuable service because they're raising their children. You know, they're still spending money, obviously, to keep the family running, but technically not making any income from that. So, again, how do we fix that? I don't know. As part of your design, you know, maybe you'll put some kind of value on volunteerism or community service or something like that. So, just identifying the problems now. And then we have to look at per capita income. That's how, you know, how much on average does the average person earn in the United States based on GDP. United States, by far, look at that, $37,500 per person. Then look down here, Central African Republic. Uh, try to pick something that was pretty low on the scale. So if you divide that over a year, what's that, about 2 or $3 a day per person? Uh, they're the folks that are, you know, still living in the huts that are out there gathering wood and burning dung and decimating the environment to survive, okay? So good measures of uh, progress. And this is, you know, this is great. But you can see here by just comparing this, we're, our vision of what the world is really like is very skewed because we have no clue. We, we're living in this land of plenty. I mean, it amazes me every time I go to a grocery store and I just look at all the food in there. My wife used to teach English as a second language for foreign adults that came to the United States and immigrated here. And uh, these folks are really hardworking people that would leave, you know, oppressive areas, Korea, things like that. And uh, a couple of them said that when they first came to the United States and they went into a grocery store, they just started crying because they couldn't believe how much food and how much material there was available <clears throat> that they didn't have in their own countries. Uh, this just kind of shows where the growth is and where the negatives are. You know, obviously we've got uh, China and other areas. But uh, again, just trying to give you an idea, here we are in the land of green. Green is money positive. You know, all the developing areas or developed countries are doing pretty well, but the developing uh, areas you can see are still at negative okay, GDPs. So the other thing we have to remember is we are no longer... The one thing about sustainability is we have to think globally, but then we've got to try to bring it down to a smaller scale. The problem is we are now, it's a gross world product. You know, we have our own economic situation, but think about how many jobs we've transferred over to China. You know, our manufacturing base is pretty much decimated in the United States. We've sent so many jobs over to overseas, so we've shifted things around. And what's happening now is the next frontier for manufacturers is Vietnam, and other countries because Chinese labor rates are starting to climb up because they want to live like us. So you're going to start to see then China's job shifting to wherever the next lowest labor rate is going to be. And that will eventually happen until eventually the cycle all catches up and we all become even-footed. But interesting, if I go in an American manufacturing plant, I walk through that plant and I see very little people. There's robots, there's very few people running the operation. I go to Mexico and I will see 50, 60 people working on one line assembling uh, doorknobs for Black & Decker. We've done work for them. A lot of people. China is even more. In China they have throw even more people at it. So very labor intensive. Okay, But we see what happens as we design people out of the system. And then globalization. Again, 2009 gross world product. Look at this. Uh, 19... 50s, 6.7 trillion, 58.07 trillion, and uh, just huge amount of money circulating around the world. Okay, so it's no longer just the United States economy, European economy. We have to think big when we think about how we're going to create jobs around the whole world. So this brings us up to the question of what is your impact? You know, what's your environmental footprint? How do you can you track that? Can you measure it? How much energy do you consume? What's your carbon footprint? You're going to learn how to do all this. You'll know it by the end of the class. How much resources do you consume? Water. What's your commitment, commitment to community? You know, do you, you spend any time interacting with people in the community? Uh, some people do. Some people don't. And then the real big thing that I like to think about is, you know, what for my kids, what am I going to leave them and what's going to happen for the next seven generations after that? Uh, so... 
you know, I'm personally interested in doing what I can to reduce my impact, but I also love the work I do because we have made tremendous impact reductions for the corporations we work for, for the buildings we worked on, you know, all kinds of things, coming up with new and better products and helping companies do that. So a lot of, a lot of good things to think about, and once you can measure this, you can at least start to manage it. Here's the situation. A lot of doom and gloom in the beginning here. Just giving you a dose of reality, that's all. But you have to open your eyes in order to think about how we're going to do this better. Now, the good thing is, over the last few years, we've had a major uptick in green activity. Okay? Whether it's all real or not, the perception is out there and the uh, motivation among many companies to improve their performance, both from an environmental perspective, economic, and then socially. So green, I would definitely say, is mainstream, in my opinion. Uh, when I see situations like that, uh, this is an older version of Newsweek, the, greening, the new greening of America. And then you got the third issue of green issue of Vanity Fair. It's pretty good because this is not a very uh, Mother Earth news kind of magazine, Vanity Fair, if you ever read it. In fact, very consumerist, consumerism, a lot of consumerism in that magazine. So we know that's a great thing. We know there's a lot of green companies okay, that are at least saying they're green. Uh, green products coming out. Uh, when I started green building practices uh, in 2001, we couldn't even find green product. What was FSC certified wood? I wanted to recycle content in my products. What the heck was that? Companies didn't even make it. So the United States Green Building Council started this whole trend of companies starting to think, hey, in the building world, we've got to make our products better. We know energy is a global dilemma, but I really think it's an opportunity. If you're an entrepreneurial person, this is the time to, if you can figure out some way to do things better, get us off of oil or make vehicles or homes or lighting more efficient, you can make a lot of money. And that's what it's about, right? Let's make a profit. Let's uh, figure out ways that we can redesign this system to do things better. Human-induced climate change, I put a question mark there. I think I can tell you for a fact we're affecting the carbon cycle. I can't say for sure that we are the only cause of these climate issues. You know, we don't know enough to say that this isn't just a natural Earth cycle. That, you know, I think we're definitely contributing, but I don't know that we are the only cause. We'll talk about that a lot in a week two or three. We also are looking at this whole green revolution as a profit center Okay, because most companies are in business to make a profit. So when General Electric has that eco-imagination commercial you see on TV, they're not doing it because they just want to be a bunch of tree huggers. They know that they can design a better diesel engine or more efficient equipment that people, they can then sell and make more money. Okay? So that's not a bad thing. Why not make some money off of reducing impacts on the planet? Sustainable development, that's what this course is all about. We're going to be talking a lot about it. And one thing that we're really getting more companies interested in, and we're seeing a lot of activity around, is product stewardship. You know, since we are a disposable society, we're starting to see more companies that are saying, hey, what really happens to my product at the end of life? You know, in Europe, it's forced. You've got the Green Dot program. You know, people have to bring back products. People are, companies in Europe are taxed on the amount of material they throw in a landfill every year. Okay, so if you put something in a landfill in Europe, Certain countries, you're paying tax every year for that ton you put in there, or, or 100 pounds, or whatever the, the measure is. So product stewardship is starting to become very predominant, and it's going to be driven really heavily by Walmart, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. If we look at this ad, this is a, a bit of an older ad, but what does Toyota sell? Cars. How many cars do you see in the picture? What are they talking about? Their green building, their new LEED certified building. So here you've got, and I can tell you this ad probably costs at least quarter million dollars. I think it was in Time Magazine front, you know, front whole, whole cover spread there. Not a cheap ad. So you've got companies that are really promoting why they're green, whether it's all true or not. Okay, so I keep talking about these three tiers of sustainability. Uh, you can look at this from, I, I keep saying about uh, economic performance, social performance, environmental performance, all very important. Another way we can look at that is we can call it planet, people, and profit. That's another way you can uh, basically classify this. Remember we were talking globally. 
what the heck is sustainability anyway? What is it going to mean? Well, there's definitions that are, that, that are out there that say that sust sustainable development will meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So what the heck does that mean? Can we put some, you know, some kind of meat behind that? Can, we, can, we, can you bring this to your boss and say, hey, we need to be sustainable because of this? The average person is not going to really understand that definition or what it really means. From a global perspective, I get it. Of course, we've got to design a system that's going to have enough resources for the next 7, 10, 15 generations that they can live whatever quality of life they choose. We also have to provide jobs for these people, and we have to really minimize the impact on the earth. Okay? So that's what the big picture looks like. But it's really a new way of thinking, like I said, that's linking environmental protection with economic growth and social goals. We have to understand also that we can have all the government intervention we want, but government does not have the power to ever drive sustainable development. It's really going to be industry and businesses which have the most money in the world. There's actually, think about Walmart, they have more money than countries right now. And we have these situations where if we don't get these companies that are making the products to do things differently, then we're going to continue to have those 4 billion pounds of toxic releases in the, this country and then all the ones that we shifted over to the other countries. We're going to continue to have situations where we're creating these products that get disposed of rather quickly. So we need business and industry to really change the way they do things. Business and industry is building whatever we're going to buy. So the more people that we educate about thing, making choices that will make change, that will kind of drive business and industry to change the way they do things, right? I already mentioned the fact that the United States Green Building Council, by issuing the LEED standards, has created a whole new market for green building products. And it's a, it's a really rapidly growing market. So by creating that standard, there's been a demand and business and industry will meet the demand for products that we will buy. The ideal would be is if we could tax things. Right now we're, they're talking about carbon taxes, right? So I already mentioned the fact that in Europe it works really well. If you tax that waste, the waste is going to be decreased. If you're paying for it every year, you're going to get really smart and decide, hey, I'm not wasting my money and paying tax on that. So these things can work. It's just not being done in, this, in the United States. Okay. So we, we have, that's a great tool that we're going to use as part of our redesign here. We're going to try to figure out ways that we can actually tax things in a manner that are going to try to change behavior and avoid negative impacts. Okay? And imagine if we could really put the cost of the extraction of the coal and all the emissions and the particulates and the mercury and the carbon and everything else that came out of making that electricity then suddenly maybe electricity should cost 30 cents a kilowatt hour from a coal plant, or 50 cents, or a dollar, whatever. You know what I mean? So, again, what I'm telling you is whatever business, business has the money and the capability of doing that. Government can help direct it. Consumers can really help direct it. But it's going to take time. And the, the good thing that's really positive is the fact that there are a lot of companies out there that are really getting this sustainability concept. I already mentioned Interface, but there's probably 600 companies now that are publishing sustainability reports. Whether they're doing everything in there or not, they're at least aware and there's a demand for them to start doing things better. So, like I said, 1988, 15 billion pounds of toxic releases. Now we're down to 3.9. Some of that's economic, you know, obviously, but uh, there have been some good changes through uh, different aspects in the government that have helped to reduce that. So when you have situations where you have companies that have more money than countries, they're obviously the big agent that we need to make the change with. Okay? And we have two really good tools to do that, and we'll learn more about that. So if we come back to this thing, economic performance, let's think about a company that's a company's in business, let's say it's a corporation, they're in business to make a profit. And if they want to have good profit, then obviously they need to be able to sell their product. Okay? And when we look at this social piece, the equity or social performance piece of the circle, 
the company has employees that are part of a community. The company also has a facility or buildings or manufacturing sites located in communities. So there's a major connection there, right? So if the company wants to do well economically, they have to have good employees, they have to have customers to buy their products. And ideally, they want to be in an area where they don't have a lot of conflict with the folks that live around the plant. We can easily quantify the environmental aspects of any operation. We know, we can tell how much electricity is used and what the carbon footprint will be, how much fuel, how many resources are extracted. So this piece is really pretty easy for us to understand. And we'll talk a lot about the environment. It was easy to focus on that tonight. The economic piece, you know, obviously is something that's easy to track. This is the hard one, and it's going to take us some time to figure this out. But you can see here, if you look at the way these rings interconnect, if all of these are working in harmony, this company's making a profit. They've got good employees, good people working for them. They're paying a fair living wage. People really want to work there. They're minimizing their impact on the planet. Uh, their emissions and waste are greatly reduced. I can tell you that some of the best performing companies from an economic perspective also have the best environmental records. Okay? So we have to figure out in this class is how we're going to get all these three rings to kind of merge like you get the sustainability aspect right in the middle. And it's a balance. Okay, because we want, we have to have a system that makes money. Because we've got to put people to work. We have to have a system that doesn't damage the environment any more than it already is. Or we're not going to have a planet to live on or we're not going to be around. And we also have all these people that we have to give jobs to and that we have to, you know, have working in harmony to make the system really work. So without all these three interacting closely, we are not going to be able to create a sustainable society in any way. Okay. Think about your own life. I think about my own company. For me to be sustainable, I've got to make sure I've got enough work coming in every month that I can make payroll for all my employees, that I can pay my bills, and that we can earn some profit to keep expanding the corporation so we can continue to do the good work we do. If, I'm not, if I don't have that work coming in, and, and you know, from a social perspective, I need really good people to work for me. So I have, you know, I'm accommodating these folks the best I can. You know, we're pretty progressive. We provide a lot of training. We're all about reducing impact. We have people that bike to work, you know, all kinds of neat things. And we know that we are already focused on reducing our environmental impact. We reduced our energy consumption by about 30, 40 percent. We reduced our waste tremendously. We have re really reduced water. So from my perspective, I'm working in this realm that I can maintain, stay sustainable. I have to work very closely with my clients and build relationships with them. So, you know, our connection also to the community is we buy local, we do volunteer work, we support organizations that are important to our mission. So all these things tie together. And you can think about this from your own life, too. And part of that is built on the fact that you, me, all of us have impacts on this environment. And our job, the way we live, everything else impacts the environment. And we also have a connection to the community, whether it's our church, our kids in school, our spouse, our significant other, whatever. We have neighbors. We have friends. We're, for us to be uh, running in a mode where we're going to be truly sustainable, we have to make all three of these things work together. It doesn't matter if you're a big corporation or one person. Okay? Our system is very reactive to what the market wants. Okay? All I'm saying here is whatever we do in here is not going to happen overnight. It took us 200 and some years to create this system that's running as it is now, and now we have to reverse things and change things. And it cannot take another 200 years because we won't be around. Nobody will be here if, we, if it takes us that long to get this straightened out. So we have to really think about how we're going to make changes to adjust this system to make it perform in a much better manner. And it's definitely a new way of thinking, okay, because just the things we talked about tonight, I can guarantee, you know, I'm sure you all have heard of some of these things, but nobody really thinks about all these different, you know, add up all these different impacts and all the things that, I talked about tonight, we probably try to ignore them because they're not very exciting and uh, happy kind of thoughts, you know what I mean, when you think about what's happening in the environment. But uh, really critical if we're going to start to cha make change. And the coolest thing is the fact that you're all in this class is a really positive thing. This is huge. Uh, we've got Walmart that just uh, started this whole sustainability index. This is their 15 questions to their ma main suppliers. And if we look at some of these questions, you know, uh, have you measured your corporate greenhouse gas emissions? So this 
questionnaire went out to 100,000 suppliers of Walmart. So suddenly this company, which is one of the largest companies in the world, is driving sustainability thinking, at least, into these companies. Whether they do it or not, if they want to continue to do business with Walmart, they have to answer these questions, and they're going to be forced to start doing these different things around energy and climate, material efficiency, resource efficiency, natural resources, and then here we are, that, sustain that social piece, people in the community. Do you know the location of where your products come from? Companies may not. We're doing some work with some big companies that source a lot of stuff from China and other Asian uh, areas, and you ask them, okay, well, where do you get the metals that come into making this product? Well, we're not sure. We know it's somebody there, but we don't have a good handle on where all these things are coming from. So this, this is something we need to look at. Not from the pers this, is a, this, to me, is a very positive thing. It's not positive for the companies that it's being forced on because somehow they've got to figure out how to pay for it, but it is, if, from the perspective of raising the level of knowledge on sustainability and at least raising the bar, this has a good, good uh, benefit to it. The ultimate goal, then, is to create uh, a database of life cycle impacts of products that they sell and then eventually a labeling system, just like food labels, that will tell you what the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are for the product or the amount of water that was used or whatever. So the average consumer will eventually be able to do this. And Walmart's the driver behind it, but they're not, they're not running the whole index. They've pushed it out to, like, the University of Arkansas and some other universities and a consortium of people that are working to develop this thing. But to me, if you've got 100,000 suppliers and these, this is a company that has a huge impact, huge. So, you know, they've been criticized for a lot of things, especially the way they pay wages, the fact they don't pay benefits. You know, they're still not, I'm not saying this is a great sustainable company. I'm just saying that they're raising the bar and forcing this on all their suppliers, and hopefully they'll start walking the talk. The social piece will be the hardest part. How do we keep paying people well and, you know, that kind of thing. You know, we were saying that industry, uh, business and industry is by far uh, the most important group or organization or entity that we want to get involved in sustainability. You know, we, we did discuss that government has a very important role to try to promote it, but to really get some ma massive changes, we're going to need business and industry to really step up and focus on uh, trying to reduce their impacts. Uh, and industry, business, whatever we want to say, you know, the folks out there that are making the big money, the BPs, the Walmarts, you know, these uh, U.S. Steel automakers, without them we're never going to, we're never going to get, move forward and we're never going to reduce these impacts. So really important that we start to focus in that realm. Uh, and then, again, like I said, government has a role, but every one of us in this room will have a role. I hope you enjoyed the video. As you can see, Many of the issues brought up in this video are kind of depressing. Good news is there's a lot happening in the world. There's a lot of companies that have really stepped up to integrate sustainability into their everyday business practices. In the work we've been doing, we've had great success working with companies like Wyndham and Unilever, San Goban, Certainteed, helping them to establish sustainability programs and really work to minimize their impacts on society and the environment. Please provide any comments below and please look for uh, future white papers. Uh, if people do comment and ask questions, I'll definitely adjust and develop my topics around the questions and comments that I receive. Thank you again for watching the video and I look forward to seeing you in the future.